before we get started, just ensure our cell phones are turned off to silent mode and we just, let's just quieten our hearts and let's look to the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity together, especially in this time of uncertainty and Lord, there's uh, anxiety in many of our, our hearts uh, about the situation that we are in. But today as we come before you, we want to set aside our worries, but we want to focus on you. And as a body, as a community, as a family, we pray, oh God, for your presence to come as we worship you, as we praise you. We lift up our eyes beyond the situation that we see around us because you still rule and reign on the throne. And we pray today that once again, oh God, speak to us through your word, minister to us by your presence and your Holy Spirit. Lord, let there, let there be tremendous love and encouragement among us as we gather in the name of Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Shall we just stand out on our feet? Let's all say the Apostles' Creed together. And then I'll pass the time to Eugene who will lead us in worship. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. 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 Hi, church. Are we ready to praise God? Amen. Yeah, I just have a verse to share over here. Yeah, up on the screen. Yeah, this is from John chapter 14, verse 6. In case you're wondering, that is not Monday. I didn't take a picture from there. So uh, Jesus was actually uh, talking to his disciples, and, and, uh, and this was, uh, he was actually telling them about his coming, his second coming actually and uh, he said that actually he'll take you for myself and where I where where I go, I am you will be also and uh, of course Thomas, one of the disciples actually asked uh, we don't know where you, you are going and so how do we know what is the way so Jesus uttered this uh, words, so in, in, chapter, in verse 6, uh, I am the way the truth and the life no one goes to the Father except through him or through me so I just want to uh, celebrate and lift his name up high and so glad that actually we have this joy that we have we found the way and uh, it's such a great time to uh, praise and worship even though we can't sing but I think we can just uh, lift our hearts to him Amen let's sing uh, Hallelujah let's praise Jesus Amen
uh, turn to your neighbor and uh, let them know Jesus is the way. Give them a wink if you can. If not, give them a blink. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I'd like to share with a song with you, this new song that we are going to sing. And it's a very beautiful song. So as you come prepare, prepare to worship Him, I'd like to take this chance to uh, talk about this song. It's uh, Only a Holy God by City of Light. It's from Australia. Uh, this song, the verses, ask a series of questions and they all include so many attributes of God. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other glory consumes like fire? And one of my favorite verses actually is on the verse 4. It says that who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? I think uh, this paints a clear picture of our fallen state that our failings cannot overcome without God. And the chorus goes, uh, Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. This invites us to taste and see the Lord's goodness. And it asks us uh, who but God is sovereign over creation. The light that defeats the darkness, more beautiful than the sun, eternal, whose sun releases us from sin, bringing him glory. So as we listen or we sing in our hearts this song, pray that you overcome by the power, the beauty, and the goodness of our holy God. Amen. Let's close our eyes, lift our hearts to him.
Thank you, Lord, that we can come to worship you today. May you, O oh God, pour your spirit upon us. Lift up our hearts, O oh God. Let us rejoice in you always, in everything, in every situation. Because you are a great God, a holy God. And this is your temple. And we pray today, O oh God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, dwell among us and in our midst. We love you and praise you and commit today's service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated now. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, musicians and singers. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. I just have a few uh, quick announcements. Uh, then we're going to the Word today. Um, at the end of the, today's service, this weekend is Mother's Day, so at the end of the service, I'll be praying for all the mothers who are here, and we also have uh, some uh, gift packs for all the mothers, okay? But um, we'll do that later on. I just have the announcement on our COVID restrictions. As you can see from the slides, right, that uh, we would, uh, uh, even Emmanuel Assembly of God is telling us that uh, let's just really... Um, uh, be vigilant, meaning let's not mix the zones. I think they also mentioned that uh, let's minimize. Um, I think I don't know. I don't know how, but there were some people who were eating, and also I thought I just make an announcement that there's no eating in this hall, especially after service. Okay. Uh, then the other thing is the next slide, please. The next slide is that um, if you attended service this weekend, then register on our app only after Wednesday 8 a.m. in the morning so that those who couldn't come will get priority to, to register on Monday and Tuesday. That's all, okay? Uh, we're not going to... Uh, no one is going to be there to, to hound you or to watch. You know, it's all just by, by uh, just respecting one another and giving each other a chance to have seats. It's, it's okay. And in fact, if let's say you want a seat but you couldn't get it, right? It's not available. You just put your name in the wait list. Based on past experience, we usually are able to put people in from the wait list into the zones. Um, for a simple reason that people at the end of the day, after they register, they couldn't make it, they, they pull out. So when you are not able to make it, it's fine. You know that we can watch it online. So you just change your status to not coming. So then you release seats for others 
uh, to be able to move from the wait list to the zones, okay? Uh, and then the other thing is whatever questions you may have, right, you just go to the app, it's already an announcement. All the questions and the Q&A is more or less all of it is there. And what we'll do is that we will just pause our CGF hitch, uh, sh uh, right sharing to church until this um, end of May. Until May. Probably let's look at how June pans out. Uh, so we will do it only after we have come out of phase two. And last but not least is our offering. If you want to give offerings, you know how you can do it through uh, scanning the QR code or there are two offering boxes at the end. Let's just pray. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity. Every week we can come to give you our offerings. We ask that you continually uh, supply all our needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That Lord, whatever situation we are in, you will watch over us, our family, and protect us. And we just pray today through the word that you once again direct our minds not on the things of this earth alone, but on things that are above. Let us look at your church. Let us learn how to be good ministers in the house of God. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so let's open up our Bibles and let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, you have, if you have been following our uh, teaching, I have been sharing with you uh, about these two M's, right? I say that 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, Paul was talking about the message. And the message that he's, he preached or he has communicated to the Corinthians, he told them, was the salvation through the cross of Jesus Christ. The salvation will come through the death of Jesus as the Messiah, and God will raise him up from the dead. And he said that this is foolishness to those who do not believe, but for those who believe, the fact that it is, it is such a foolish message, because he's talking about a Jewish man dying on the cross, and then how God raised him from the dead and he has now become the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he becomes the Savior of the world. But the fact that you believe in this is the power of God at work in your life. Okay? Now, so uh, just last week, I had a uh, time to fellowship with a pastor. And he was sharing with me how he grew up uh, in his house and his whole entire family were, were non-believers. And he was already very steep okay, into another faith, another religion, and he was all uh, almost prepared to go into full-time ministry in that particular faith. And he said, he was in the army, that one of his friends, um, you know, was a Christian, so the, the, the friend, uh, he was so steep, right, in his own faith, he, he, he brought this Christian friend and sat him down and for three days tried to preach to him, to try to convert the Christian. So after the three days is over, the Christian uh, brother said, uh, I, don't, I do not need three days, now that I've listened to you for three days, I do not need three days to share with you my faith, but I will ask you one question and you take three days to, to think of the answer. And the question was this. He says, after sharing all these things with me about your faith, I want to ask you, what is the relationship that you have with this uh, faith that you belong to? That's all. So what is the relationship that you have with this, this uh, image or this idol or this God that you, you, are, you are following? And, that, and, and this pastor says, it took me three days and I cannot come up with an answer. And then when he came back and asked the friend, and says, so now you tell me, what is the relationship you have with your God? He said, my God is my saviour. My God is my father. My God is... Uh, He's my creator and he was able to list everything. And he says, just by that alone, he said he turned his whole life around and within one year, he decided that he wants to be a full-time pastor. And, and we keep hearing stories like this, amazing stories like this, because how does a person turn? Why does it suddenly, you know, light shines into him and he starts to believe? It is the power of God. Every time... I share a sermon. I am a human vessel, imperfect. My mind is limited. But every time I share the word and it changes your life or you believe in it and you, it, it transforms you. It causes you not to live in bitterness or resentment or fear. You don't live in anger and you're able to change. It's not me. 
It's the word. It's the power of God at work in your life. That's what Paul says. That's why he says, I am determined. I decided that I'm not going to compromise the message. I'm just going to preach Christ and Him crucified. And that is the wisdom of God. And that is the power of God. And I put down here on the third point a, a statement. I want you to see this statement. That God determined that death must come in order for new life to begin. This is the wisdom of God. And this is the power of God. Every time you want new life to begin, you must be willing to go through a certain form of death. Otherwise, there will be no newness. Right? So even in my own life, in my own life, going through my trial and accepting that I will go to jail, accepting it, all right, and then asking God for His mercy allows me to come into newness of life. It is when I keep on holding back, okay, if let's say I, I didn't, but let's say I keep holding back to the past uh, and be resentful of what has happened to my life, I will forever get stuck. But I'm able to accept accept a form of death and God brings me into newness of life. And after I came out of prison, the first thing I told myself I must do and I felt led to do was to go into a seminary, go for training, start afresh again as a student. And many of the things that I share with you, if I had not gone to Singapore Bible College, I would not have ex been exposed to certain books, commentaries, lecturers and professors who gave me a new way of thinking. I wouldn't have. So now I'm in a sense experiencing a newness of life after going through death. And God intends for it this way. God does it this way for Israel by bringing them into, into exile into Babylon, a form of death. And He allows Jerusalem to be destroyed. He allows the, old, the first temple, Solomon's temple, to be burned down. After they go into exile, brought them back again. They built the second temple. But that second temple wasn't something that God wanted because it has become a national monument that has prohibited the Gentiles from coming to God. And God says, remove it, remove it, let it die so that there will be a new temple that will arise, the body, the resurrected body of Jesus Christ so that all over the world, all can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. So God determined and purposed in this way that death must come in order for new life to begin. And you hear me saying this again and again because this is a narrative from Genesis to Revelation. And every week when you come and you hear again and again, after a while, this story will etch in your mind. Why is the cross so central? Why is the destruction of the temple or the pronouncement of the destruction of the temple so crucial and how the gospel has now come to the Gentile world? And the fourth point is this. This thing that I'm sharing with you is understood by those who have the Holy Spirit. And it demonstrates the power of God that is at work in a person's life. So this is the message, okay? And this is what we learned last week. So now, today, our text is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we will be looking at the messenger or the minister uh, of this message. So I titled my message today called God's Ministers. The messenger, okay? Now, when you have gone through school, right, in, the, in your younger days, what makes you like mathematics? Or what makes you hate mathematics? What, what makes you like literature or hate literature? Very often, I think 9 out of 10 times, it's the teacher. Okay? If you, have a, if you had a good teacher, you would love that subject. And when I was in secondary school, secondary 2, I had a very good mathematics teacher. She was so clear in her explanation and she was so um, helpful, you know, that I, had, I fell in love. I had such love for mathematics that I would do all the 10-year series without the teacher re requesting. I would do and, and um, I, I, I love math, math so much that I, I even gave free tuition to help someone who is not good at it. But all because of the teacher. Now, so similarly, it is very important okay, for us to understand how we should be good ministers in the house of God. Do you understand? How you and I are ministers will really determine whether people will love the house of God or they will come to the house of God and like in Corinthians we see, division. 
quarrels and fights that cause people to, to say, if this is the kind of church, I don't want to be involved in it. You understand? If this is the house of God, then I have nothing to do with it. No, but we should be good ministers, like what Paul is teaching us, then we can have a church where when members come, when, when, the, when God's children come, they feel that this is a good family that they want to belong to. Okay, so the, I'm going to share with you three aspects of church leadership or ministry uh, over God's people, according to what Paul says. Just three aspects. The first one, all these are not so difficult to understand, but stay with me, okay? The first one is that a church minister or a good Christian leader, he will lead God's people to spiritual maturity. And that is the goal, uh, Maturity is the goal, okay? So Paul now in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 to 4, if you can just look at your Bible, he says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, okay? I cannot address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? All these passages, you know, we have read them many times, but I want to break it down for you. Okay, I break it down for you because last time, the last, last week when we learned, we learned that Paul considers all human beings as sukikos. Sukikos is where you get the word psyche, soul, okay? Every human being is a soul being. Where do we get that concept? Genesis. When God created Adam, breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and he became a living soul or a living being, sukikos, okay? And Paul considers that as a natural person. Natural person. Where do you get that? Uh, you, you look at this uh, verse 2, chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, the natural person, you see that? Does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. The natural person. Then you have, uh, Paul then says that those who are influenced by the Holy Spirit, they are pneumatikos. Pneuma, spirit, spiritual person. Okay, where do you get that? Verse 15, chapter 2. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. So now you can see there is a distinction now, uh, a, a, a natural person and a spiritual person. Now, then he adds now a third distinction, and this third distinction is sakikos, where S-A-R-X is it means, in Greek, okay, it means flesh. People of the flesh. So where do we get that? Earlier on in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, verse 3 says, For you are still of the flesh. So we have sukikos, pneumatikos, and sakikos. Soul people, natural people, spirit people, spiritual person, and fleshly. Okay, fleshly or people of the flesh. So it is important for us to break it down and for us to understand what each refers to so then it helps us to understand what he's trying to say. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians 9, 11, this is what Paul says, okay? He says, if we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Saki cost, material things. So, here you find that flesh, when it comes to flesh, it actually relates to material stuff. So, what is the difference between that and uh, sukikos? It's because sukikos is like a, sp a, a soul being. But sakikos is the flesh. Things to do with material things and the fleshly desires or pleasures in our life. Okay? Now, then he gave another example in Romans chapter 7, verse 14. 
It says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sarkikos, soul under sin. And what it means is, the law is spirit-driven, but you and I, human beings, we are flesh-driven. Paul says, we are flesh-driven, resulting in us being sold to slavery, to sin. Scholars believe that when he wrote Romans chapter 7, verse 14, it is, he's referring to himself not yet being born again. Okay? Well, we do not know, but let, let's continue. We are, we're looking at 1 Corinthians 3. Now, so this time, in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, it gives a stronger emphasis on one's thoughts, decisions, and actions being driven by our flesh or the needs of our flesh. So I so I put in a, in a PPT, so they make it easy for everyone. A person of the flesh makes decisions not determined by God, but by consideration internal to themselves. So that is the difference. A fleshly person is a person who goes according to his own physical desires, his thoughts, his decisions, his actions are all according to his own desires. That is distinct from God. So if we can summarize this way, right? The Corinthians are no more, are no longer mere sukikos. They are no longer just soul people because they have already been born again. They are spirit people. But even while they are spirit people, they still continue to go according to their flesh. And therefore, Paul considers them infants rather than mature. If you are mature, you are a person who is led by the Spirit. You are already born again. You are, you are a pneumaticos. You are a spirit person. If you are mature, means you are led by the Spirit. But if you are infant in Christ, means you are led by your flesh. Okay? So, to help you, I put up a table, very simple. You have on the left side, on your left, okay? Soul people, which is natural people. And the right side is born again of the spirit, spiritual people. But if you are a soul person, you cannot understand, unable to understand spiritual things. Got it? But if you are born again, you have two, two kinds. One is led by the spirit and therefore makes you mature in Christ. Or you are led by the flesh and therefore it makes you an infant in Christ. Okay, simple? Right. So, uh, Paul is saying now, okay, let's look back at the script, uh, at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse, verse 1, right? I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. So now you can understand. They may be already born again, but they are still infants, yeah, because they're going according to the flesh. And he said, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And then he says, and even now, you are not yet ready. So in other words, now what he's writing to them, okay, what he's writing, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1 to 4, he, he's writing to them about how they view church leadership, why are there still quarrels and fights among them. He says, then you're not ready for mature stuff. You are still infants in Christ. Because you are now a spirit, born again spiritual person, and you're still fighting. You're still quarreling. Okay, so that is his thing, is his point. And then not only that, chapter 5, chapter 6, we are going to go into that soon, right? Uh, he, wrote, he wrote to them about uh, brothers bringing another person to court, suing, uh, sexual immorality in the church. So he's saying, if you are mature, then I don't need to write all these things to you. So I am writing all these things to you now because you are still infants. You are still walking in the flesh. Verse 3, for you, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? So, if you are a good Christian minister, a leader in a church, Paul says, or, or I, sh I should say, we, when we look at Paul, we see he assesses the situation in the church. He was able to pinpoint that they are still infants, and what must he do? His role and his job is to bring them into spiritual maturity. 
So how does he do that? Okay, how does he bring them into spiritual maturity? He then gives them the second thing, and that is he gives them the right perspective about church leaders. The first one is he assesses the situation, recognizes that they are spiritually immature. He wants to help them to be mature. He does the second thing. He teaches them the right perspective of how you should view Christian ministers. And I just want to quickly say this, that a Christian minister or church minister serves faithfully under God's authority. They are servants. They are not owners. Okay? What do you mean by that? That means they are servants under God to serve the church of God. They are not owners of the church. Think, be very, very clear about that. Okay, later on you're going to see how Paul again and again emphasized he is just merely a servant. He is not an owner. The real owner of the church, that means, in other words, the church belongs to who? It doesn't belong to Paul. The church belongs to God. For the church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That is where he's going. Okay? So, you know the Corinthians, I told you already from the last two lessons, right? They were boasting over their spiritual leaders. They were taking sides. They were saying, I'm of Paul. Another say, I'm of Apollos. Another say, I'm of Cephas, which is Peter. But Paul did not accept such exaltation. Okay? Instead, he gives them a proper perspective on leadership, on how five expressions, five different expressions to describe God's ministers. And what, what are they? That they are servants, farmers, architects, officers, and administrators. And this is where point number two, we're going to look at these five things. And to Paul, none of these five uh, roles, you can call them, roles and responsibility, are significant compared to God and the Corinthians. In other words, I want you to think this way. These five roles and responsibility of a servant of God is to help the church. This is the church. The church is God's dwelling place. They are mere servants. What is most important is God and the church. God's relationship with the church, the church's relationship with God. We as servants, we are just here to serve. That is this, his concept. So therefore he's saying to the Corinthians, you don't belong to me. You belong to God. I am here to help you. Okay? All right. So let's look at it. Number one, servants. Servants, we can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5. He say, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? That means, why are you all squabbling over who you belong to? Who are we? We are, verse 5, right? Servants through whom you believe. Die konoi. I am just a servant. That's where you get the word deacons, okay, servants. Paul wanted the Corinthians to view both himself and Apollos as mere servants performing menial tasks. But what is more important is that these servants are servants who have been assigned tasks by God. Right? Think of a rich man with a very big house. And in this house, this rich man, a wealthy man, has many servants, and he will assign different servants tasks to do. So Paul says, we are just like that servant being assigned a task. We are assigned a task so that, you see, look at verse 5. Servants through whom you believe as the Lord assigned to each. You understand? As the Lord assigned task to to each of us. So what is he saying? I was assigned the task to come to Corinth and to minister to you and the church started. Then Paul went on in his missionary journey. Apollos came, assigned by Lord Jesus to continue pastoring the church. But we are all just menial servants. Assigned task by our master. Are you following? Okay. All right. Then the second uh, role and responsibility or image expression he uses is a farmer. Okay. Because you can look at verse 6, right? I planted, Apollos watered. 
but God gave the growth. Okay, so Paul was responsible for sowing seeds. Apollos was responsible for watering the seedlings that had taken root. So again, you can see this, okay? It is the picture of a wealthy man's house because a wealthy man will have servants and a wealthy man will have gardeners that will manage his estate. So that's how Paul is looking at it. Now, then he says, whatever it is, okay, the honour belongs to God alone and not to the workers because even if the workers or the farmers were faithful in sowing and they were faithful in watering, yielding fruit was not a guarantee. Yielding fruit still came from God. So no honour and no glory to the workers. In fact, he continues to say this, verse 7. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one and each will receive his wages according to his labour. Okay, so what does that mean? See, when you are a worker and if you are a worker that receives wages, it tells you one thing, you are not the owner. So Paul says, I'm assigned task, Apollos is, is, is assigned a task, and as we do it, and if we do it well, our master will give us our wages or our reward. But we are only serving the master and you, Corinthians. Very important. That's such a right perspective on church leadership, I think is very, very crucial. Okay? Then he says this, he who plants and he who waters, right? I read to you verse 8, are one. What do, what do you mean by are one? That means they are equal. They are equal. So you shouldn't look at Apollos as lesser than Paul. Shouldn't look at Cephas, Peter, as more than Paul. He says, no, we are all one. means we are all equal. And each of us will receive our wages according to the assigned task that we have done. All right, now, then verse 9, uh, verse nine he, he reiterates one more point, okay? It's very important. Verse 9, he says, For we are God's fellow workers. What does that mean? Okay, look at it this way. Huh? We are God's workers. We means Apollos and Paul. They are fellow workers, equal. And he uses it, we are God's worker. It means we are equal under God. We belong to God. We are His workers, but we are fellow workers. So the key message is this. The important relationship here, again and again, you will see, is that Paul is showing that the important relationship is really God and the Corinthian church. And he puts himself aside as merely a servant and a farmer. So then he makes this statement, verse 9. We are God's fellow workers, you, Corinthians, you are God's few and you are God's building. You, we, we are fellow workers under God. You are God's few, you are God's work, who are building. That means God dwells with you. The important relationship is you and God. This is such a humbling self-evaluation of Christian ministry. Very. So that's why I shared with you earlier on, right, that I really do not think it is necessary for anyone to say, I only want to come and be baptized by Pastor Tan. Or I want only to be, uh, to have hands laid by him or by her. The right perspective is the church and God's relationship. All right, okay, third one, okay, which is the third expression, okay. He uses this word, master builder. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. You see the word master builder? In the Greek, is this word, architecton. Architect, right, that's where you get the word architect. So, Paul's third image was a skilled or master architect. Why is he, why does he claim 
himself okay, to be a skilled or a wise master builder. Because in the NKJV translation, it is the word wise. In the ESV, it says skill. Now, Paul's wisdom is not in he himself being so wise. He, he really makes it very clear. His wisdom is in him laying the right foundation. Okay, what is that foundation? He says here, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. And let each one take, how, take heed how or take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So one more time, okay? His wisdom as a skilled architect or as a wise builder is because he laid the foundation, Jesus Christ or Christ crucified. That is why he says he's wise. All right, then let's, let's, let's go on, okay, uh, to the next image. Because there are five, right? We have done three. I'll do the next two images, and then later on, then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about building on Christ as a foundation. Because that has to do with my third point. And my third point is about how each one's work will be tested or examined, all right, and, and, and be appraised. So I will skip that first. Let's go on to the fourth row. The fourth row is actually in chapter 4 and verse 1. Let me just read to you. It says, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ. Now even the word, even though the word is servants there, which is the same as the earlier word, right? But in the Greek, it's a different word. Earlier on in the Greek word we read was diakonoi. This one is huperitis. And huperitis is a different meaning in the sense that it has a little bit higher status of an officer. Okay? Officer. So not just a diaconos, a, a, a menial servant, but now an officer. So I just put up on the PPT. This is a, a religious and a political title. Okay? In, the, in politics, okay, an officer was someone below the judge and his responsibility is over prisoners. So he serves under the judge. Okay? And I show you the reference over there, Matthew chapter 5, verse 25. In a religious realm, an officer serves the high priest, he guards the temple, and he guards the temple scroll. If you remember in Luke's gospel, Jesus went to the synagogue, he took out a scroll, and he read from Isaiah. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, right? That, that passage. After he read finish, he said he rolled up the scroll and passed it to the officer. So the officer is the one that guards the scroll. Do you understand? So politics is under a judge. In the religious realm, the officers serve under the high priest. So guess what Paul is trying to, what is the image he's trying to show over here? He's trying to say that we are serving Jesus, who is the judge and the great high priest. Do you understand? We as servants or officers, huperitis, we serve Jesus Christ, who is the judge and the great high priest. Okay? Now then one more, fifth one, the last one, stewards. It's also in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, sorry, yeah, 1 Corinthians 4 and the second part of this verse. He said, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So this word steward is the word oikonomos. Oikonomos. Oikonomos can be translated as administrator, uh, overseer, or even a treasurer. So think of it this way. This rich man, he has a big estate. He has menial servants, gardeners. He has um, builders who help him build. He has officers and he has this guy who is like the manager of his estate, the treasurer of his estate. You understand? So think of it this way and you will get the picture of what Paul is trying to show. All different kinds of ministers and servants, but all of them are just servants. They are not owners. Get it? And because they are all different kinds of servants, it gives the picture of, of different ministries. Apollos, Paul, Cephas, 
everyone being assigned different tasks by the master. So if you understand like that, later on when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, 14, he will then say that there are different kinds of gifts. Yeah, different kinds of gifts. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, prophecy, faith, healings, etc. Then he, he even said there are different kinds of uh, apo- the, uh, fivefold ministry, right? Apostles, prophets, evangelists. So we have to deal with it now here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 to understand what he's thinking before we hit 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. Because by the time when we think of apostle, we start to think, whoa, this guy walks around with wind, right? Do you understand what I'm trying to say now? You start to think, pastor, evangelist. But he already set the foundation here. That what is really more important is God and the church. We are just servants. Very important. And when you understand this, then you understand how to work with others who are of a different giftings, a different calling, right, Uh, that the Holy Spirit has given, so you all can work together and not feel that you need to tear the church apart, that this is my territory. And the other person said, that is my territory. It's none of your territory. You are not the owners. You are only servants. So Paul assessed that the, the, where their quarrels and their fights among the Corinthians, he already assessed them as not spiritually mature. Don't understand. They don't understand uh, the right or don't have the right perspective of how a church should be. And now he teaches them and tells them, gives them the right perspective. Now, an oikonomos, okay, uh, Oikos, oikos means home or house. Nomos is law. Okay, so he is the person who manages a household. Uh, he, is the, he is the legal guardian, like so to speak. Think of Joseph in Potiphar's house. Where Joseph says, in a sense he says, uh, the master, Potiphar, has given everything to my care. Right? Except, you, Potiphar's wife. He said, how can I lay hands on, lay my hand on you? So that is the idea and the image. All these roles that I share with you, five roles, have one thing in common. They all labor under the Lord or the Master and they are not owners. They are not owners of the house and they are not owners of the church. Right, so let's come to the third point, my final point. So now that Paul has assessed the situation, see that they are not mature, brings them to the right perspective, he now tells them the third thing, and that is a church minister's work will be tested and he will be appraised. In other words, he must build on Christ the foundation. And if he does not build on that, and he cannot withstand the examination and the inspection that is going to come, then everything he does, he will lose it. He will, he will not get his reward and he will, uh, he will lose his, um, whatever that he has built will be destroyed, basically. That's what he's saying. Okay, so let's look at the, the, the scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Okay, I think we have read this many times. Now, when you read this verse, right, I think, first of all, let's deal with the different materials that are used that he mentioned over here. He says, wood, hay, straw. So when you first read this verse, and that's how I would read it all this while, I would read it as, you don't want to build using wood, hay, and straw. You only want to build using gold, silver, and precious stones. That's how we read. But when you think of a house, right? When you think of a real physical house, there's no way that you build everything with marble, gold, and silver. Wood is for beams. Hay and straw is for bricks. You have to make bricks. 
So you, so I don't think Paul is trying to say that all these materials are not good. But I think he's trying to say, which is here in verse chapter 12, one more time, let's read it slowly. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, if you do not build on the foundation, the right foundation, that's where you get into trouble. But if you are building a, on the foundation, that is the right thing to do. So in other words, I just want to say this. Your, and, your success and my success, or your failure and my failure, okay? Success or failure was not determined by the material that one uses. Because each person builds as he is given assignment by the master. Let me say it one more time. Your success and failure is not by the material you use because if today you are a bricklayer, I cannot blame you for not being a goldsmith. Let's put it this way. If today your role, your role in building a house is to be a bricklayer, I cannot blame you that you didn't do the electricity or that you're not the electrician. It's two different roles. But it's whether when you build that time, do you build it according to the foundation? That means a in line with the foundation. Okay, so I think that is more important. So, success or failure is determined by the connection the construction had to the foundation. Any work that stood firmly on the foundation would last. Okay, now, then let's go on to this problematic verse in verse 13, okay? Why is it problematic? Because it says, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. And, ESV doesn't help us. In fact, most Bibles don't help us by putting a capital D. Like D-Day. So when you think of D-Day, you think of the Day of Judgment. And then later on, he says, for the fire will reveal it. What sort of work it is. Oh, then we think hellfire or hell's fire. All right? The Day of Judgment. <sighs> Let me ask you one simple question. Okay? Will you, after you build a house, Torch it to test it. No, right? It doesn't... Actually, if we don't have this capital D, and we just think of it as a normal day. So after you build a house, right, the, when the sun shines, when the sun rises, and the day comes upon the house, you will be able to inspect, inspect whether this house is built properly or not. That's all. So it's more a, a term for examination or inspection. And this is something that you and I, we can understand. Because when you, any buildings in Singapore, after it has been built, it, you have to go through this thing before you have the T.O.P. They have to come, people have to come and inspect. I don't think anyone does inspection at night. They usually do it in the daytime. So it's like when the day comes, everyone's work will have a certain... Uh, will be in, you know, there will be examination and inspection. So Paul's question is, to all the ministers, his question is, is your ministry able to stand up to examination? And what about the fire, right? And fiery trials. Are you building on a foundation that is strong? Remember in, in the gospel, there is a, an analogy that if you build your house on the rock, then when the wind comes, the rain, and, and the flood comes, it will stand, you see. So it's a question of, are you building on a solid foundation so that it will withstand examination and fiery trials? So, how do we understand this part? If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, you will see very clearly, okay? Let me just read to you. If you can look at verse uh, 4, of 1 Corinthians 4. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Can you see that? So Paul is saying, look, Paul is saying, in my ministry, I do not know anything that I've done that is not right. It means I built on the foundation of Christ. But even so, I cannot thereby acquit myself the Lord will come and He will be my judge. Look, look at verse 5. 
Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So, it seems to give the impression that Jesus himself will come and inspect his house whether the house was built properly or not. So it's not really about a future D-Day judgment at the end of time, but it is, it is uh, constantly the Lord comes and He inspects the church, His church. Alright, so let's go, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. And so Paul says this, that if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, then he will receive a reward. And therefore, if we compare it with earlier on, remember the farmer, if the farmer does, uh, 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 you know, there is growth, right? He plants, he waters, that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. If the farmer does a good job, he will receive his wages. So over here, I will see this reward as similar to that farmer receiving his wages. So if you are a good builder and you build it on the foundation, and during the inspection, when the inspection comes and you pass, you survive the inspection, you will receive your wages. However, verse 15, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. In other words, if the work could not survive the inspection and he cannot withstand the trial, the builder will lose everything. God will not allow it to be built. It will be taken down. Everything will be removed, or in a sense, you can say burned, but the builder himself will be safe. So it's not going to be, it's not going to affect his salvation. But then everything he builds, he cannot receive the reward, and he cannot receive his wages, and he cannot look at the building and go like, I have a part to play in building this building, because it will be removed. Now, let me just think of it this way, okay? I would think of this passage and think of those days in Corinth where there were temples. You know, Corinthian temp uh, pillars? If you now see some maps, right, you will see some ruins and you have the leftover Corinthian pillars and then you have the guide telling you this was where maybe uh, goddess Aphrodite this was a temple to the goddess Aphrodite. So these buildings or these temples, ultimately what happened to them? They were destroyed. They were taken down. It didn't last time. It didn't, it didn't last the test of time and the fiery trials that came. But look at the church of Jesus Christ. It has continued for the last 2,000 years. So how can we ensure that the church can continue to grow and, and Jesus, when He comes, He will be pleased with the church? Build it on the right foundation. Alright? Now, another analogy I can think of is the temple in Jerusalem. Because that is a more literal burning down. In AD 70, when the Romans besieged Jerusalem, they burn down the temple. So when God says, I do not want this anymore, it's not pleasing to me, He will allow some forces to destroy it and take it away and you'll be removed. You see that? Okay, so now, but, but, in the middle of this passage, it's verse 16 to 17, which is very important. So Paul says, However, we are not talking about burning down now. We are looking at you. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. So one more time, okay? If this foundation is Jesus Christ, this is the temple of God, it's a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Nothing is going to destroy it. 
compare this with the other temples or, that I mentioned earlier on. Whatever temple that God does not want, over time it will be removed. But if this is the temple He wants, which is the church, then it will remain. In fact, if anyone wants to destroy God's temple, the, Paul says God will destroy him. And we heard this story so many times already. You know, in, um, in, when I was doing all this uh, history, church history, uh, Asian church history, and looking at the history of the church, right, in my school, and we'll see how um, missionaries, when they go into a new place, they will have persecution. And we always read that after the persecution of the church, the church triumphed. The church triumph or they thrive means they continue to grow. In fact, they multiply after every persecution. So it's almost like the more you try to destroy or persecute the church, the more the church grows and multiplies. And we've seen this in church history. So these are the three points, okay? Paul assesses, sees them quarreling, fighting with strife because they are quarreling about who they belong to. Paul brings them to the right perspective. You don't belong to us. You belong to God. God dwells among you. We are just servants. Then he, say, then he says, in fact, let me tell you, all of us ministers, everything we have done or every work that we do will be appraised. It will be inspected. Whether is our work built on the right foundation. So it's very clear. One whole chapter, he deals with this. All right. Now, let's continue, okay? Verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. So, he's just basically saying, all you ministers in Corinth right now, I think he's addressing some leaders. Don't think that you just because you think you are wise, then you are wise. The Lord will come one day and the light will shine and reveal all the hidden darkness in their hearts. Okay, so Paul is saying, don't deceive yourself. So remember earlier on I read, he says just because he himself didn't, doesn't think that there's anything wrong with what he's done, he says, I cannot thereby acquit myself. I will wait for the Lord Jesus to come and He will be my judge. So don't be deceived. Don't deceive yourself. Alright, so let's continue and then I'll, I'll bring you to a conclusion, okay? So the Corinthians were boasting, right, over their spiritual leaders. But Paul reminds them that their spiritual leaders were each laborers themselves who had been given a specific task. They were all equal and they were all God's workers and they are accountable to God. Only God and the Corinthians mattered because God's spirit dwells in them. So this is my conclusion. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 21 to 23 says this. This is the conclusion here. So let no one boast in men for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God. Paul says, church, you don't belong to us. In fact, we belong to you because we are just servants. Such a nice picture. It's such a beautiful picture because if you think about it this way, you think of the church as the sons and daughters of God. And you think of the apostle Paul himself thinking that he is a servant. And in a rich man's house, the servant's role is to serve the children of the master. The children do not belong to the servants. The children belong to the master or to the father. And that is the picture he constantly presents to the Corinthians. So Paul, Apollos, and Cephas, right? They were servants. They were not owners. They certainly don't own the Corinthian church. So what are my three main points again? I have the musicians to come. A church minister leads God's people to spiritual maturity. A church minister serves faithfully under God's authority and a church minister's work will be tested or praised. 
So my question now is, when you assess yourself, do you see yourself as a mature believer? For where there's strife and quarrels and fights, Paul says, are you not behaving like a mere human, meaning flesh, sarkikos? Are you not still carnal? But are you mature? Are you led by the Spirit or still led by the flesh? Thank God, I think our church is in a sense quite, we are get, in a sense in, in this regard, we are in a good place, but, but we're only one year, four months old. Who is to say in, when we are two years or three years or five years old, what will happen? So when I have a chance to do a book in this way and do chapter by chapter in this way, I want to lay a good foundation and get everyone on the same page on what this church is about. The second question I have is about your ministry and my ministry. That are we building on Christ, the message of the cross, Christ and Him crucified? Why is that important? Because God determines that there will be no new life if there was no death. So, put the cross in the center of our life. At the cross, there's forgiveness. At the cross, there's no more bitterness. We lay it down at the cross. We come to the cross with our brokenness, with our sin. We walk away from the cross with peace, receiving forgiveness and reconciliation with God. All of these things are so important. So it's very important for us to have a very humble and accurate self-evaluation of our own Christian ministry. We are the temple of God. We are holy because God's Spirit dwells in us. Let's just close in prayer. Hallelujah. Lord, I just pray for our church and pray for us, everyone who are ministers in this church. That we will lead this church to maturity. And that we are always mindful that we are servants, not owners. And that what matters is the relationship that you have with the church. You dwell among us. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we pray, O oh God, that in everything that we do, we want to be a wise master builder not by natural human wisdom, but because we are building on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. That everything that we do, everything we say, even our sermons, Lord, bring us back again to focus on Christ and Christ alone. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's just sing this song in response to God before we end today's service. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you.
before we go today, I want to pray for all the mothers, all right? This weekend, it's Mother's Day. And on behalf of all the volunteers, right, who have prepared the gift pack, I'll just show you the gift pack. So when you, when you leave this hall later on, there, they have um, very meticulously and with a lot of heart went to source for very nice mask. Not the face mask, the mask for your face. Yeah. For your hands, for your feet, for your eyes. We just want to tell you that we love you and appreciate all of you for everything that you have, uh, all the sacrifices you have given to your family. Yeah. So why don't we just close our eyes? If your mother here, you can lift up your hands. We are not able to go around and lay hands, but we just pray in our hearts. Father, we just pray that you will remember all the mothers that is here in our church. You have given them to us as gifts. And I just pray, oh God, that you will honour them today on this weekend, that their family members, their children, their spouse would show them and shower them with love and care. And we pray, oh God, that you will make them feel so loved and appreciated that there's joy that will flow out of their hearts. Pray that you give them peace. Pray you give them good health. Pray that you watch over their coming in and their going forth. Father, we lift up all our mothers to you and pray that on this special weekend that you will honour them and remember all their needs and answer their prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give all our mothers a big hand and God bless you. Alright, well, we appreciate you. Appreciate you very much. Okay, so... Um, Two, two things very important and that is all, all the bags in there there is a handwritten note to the mother so you take that for yourself but we also have those that are open up like this where you can take an extra for some mother that you for example your mom is not in church so you can actually take it and inside there's a card that you can write to give to your mom okay, so uh, we have more we, have, we should have enough for all of us so Take one for yourself and take one for someone uh, that you're reaching out to. Say, so, so if you're a child here, you don't take one for yourself. You only take for your mom, right? You understand? Okay. And then last but not least, we want to say the Lord's Prayer. And then we want to give you the benediction and then we can go today. All right. Come, let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. 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 See you again next week. God bless you. Stay safe, okay? Yeah, be vigilant, stay safe, stay healthy. God bless.